Good morning, one and all. A very warm welcome. I, Tenukar, Assistant Professor, Civil Engineering Department, Jain Institute of Technology, Davangere. On behalf of my organization, it's my pleasure to extend cheerful and heartily welcome to you all. It gives me an immense great pleasure to grace all of your presence. We are here to present a session on intellectual property rights and intellectual property management for startup. Presenting by Mr. Kiran Betadapur sir in association with Institutions Innovation Council. It is a glorious moment to welcome our beloved principal, Dr. Ganesh D.B. sir for this occasion. I welcome you sir. Thank you. Thank you. I extend my warm welcome to our beloved head of the department, Dr. Rahul J. Patil sir for this event. Welcome you sir. Thank you madam. I would also like to extend a special welcome for today's chief guest, eminent speaker, Mr. Kiran Baddapur sir, advocate and patent attorney for this occasion. I welcome you sir. Kiran sir, unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to welcome faculty IIC coordinators of Jain Institute of Technology, Davangere. Now, I welcome departmental faculty IIC coordinators, Assistant Professor Kiran Kumar MS and Assistant Professor Harish KS. Welcome you, sir. Thank you, madam. I also extend my warm welcome to HODs of various departments, faculty members of JIT, faculty members of other colleges, research scholars, industrial persons, and my dear student friends. I welcome all the participants who are present here. Now, I would like to invite our beloved principal, sir, to address the gathering. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, respected uh, chief guest of today's function, uh, Kiran, uh, Kiran Badadapur, uh, the advocate and uh, patent uh, uh, attorney uh, general, and uh, uh, HOD of uh, civil engineering department, professors and heads of uh, various departments, and my dear students and participants. Uh, I first I thank our uh, uh, today's uh, speaker Kiran sir for accepting our invitation and being with us uh, to obey some uh, uh, to give the uh, the talk about intellectual property rights. Uh, sir, it's a really uh, great opportunity for all of us uh, to hear you, and uh, this you uh, know. Uh, Jain Institute of Technology is always uh, uh, look for look forward to give the updated and uh, innovative uh, needs uh, to fulfill the innovative needs of uh, uh, the students. So, Institution Innovation Council, as all of you know, uh, it's an initiation of uh, government of uh, uh, India, and uh, wherein uh, to to bring the culture of uh, innovation and uh, in the institution especially in the uh, engineering institution. Uh, it's, uh, this uh, platform is uh, uh, started and accordingly, we are making best use of it. Uh, uh, Jain Institute of Technology making best of use. Uh, we are uh, using this platform and extending this to the students. So wherein if they have any ideas or uh, if, you have, if they have the, uh, the uh, culture, uh, if they want to um, show their uh, interest in the innovation and if they have any uh, these kind of things uh, to support that uh, this platform is there along with this uh, we have the incubation we are planning to start the incubation center and also the associate uh, with uh, some of the best incubation center uh, and uh, so that will give the, the every opportunity uh, for the students uh, to inculcate this culture because the innovation nowadays, the innovation uh, for engineers is very much uh, essential. So in this regard, so we are taking this initiative. I uh, request all the uh, faculty and the students to make best use of this. So especially the, the today's topic is concerned, uh, the IPR 
uh, is a very much essential. Once you start the innovation, the protection of our ideas is very much essential. So all of you should aware of these things. So what are the legal aspect of it and how you can go ahead with this. So this uh, knowledge uh, to give this about these things, uh, this knowledge uh, today we are conducting this. So be with uh, the, you listen to the uh, guest and uh, if any queries and all there, so sir will clarify all of you and uh, you can make a best use of these things. Uh, thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, uh, over to uh, Renkam. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable and motivational words. Now, I would like to call upon our beloved head of the department, Dr. Rahul J. Patil, sir, to share a few words about, about the event. Over to you, sir. Okay. Very good morning to everyone. So, myself, Dr. Rahul Patil, head of the department, Civil Engineering, Genesis of Technology, Downgare. First, I would like to thank our organizers uh, who has organized uh, such an event. And uh, I thank all the participants uh, over the state and other states who have joined today. And I especially thank our uh, today's uh, resource person, Kiran sir, for joining us because of his uh, schedule. And as already he has a uh, schedule in uh, his uh, Atel Academy, but even though in his busy schedule, he has given us uh, time. And uh, as principal sir told, adding a few points uh, with his uh, words, I would like to thank our uh, principal as well as management for giving us an opportunity so that we are conducting various types of uh, technical talks and webinars to keep our students involved in such activities. So that tomorrow, if they come outside this particular uh, education, they will uh, face uh, uh, such kind of problems so that uh, they can uh, like uh, interviews or uh, any practical exposures uh, where they are lagging. So in such things, uh, the students will get involved here now uh, so that our Department of Civil Engineering is concentrating more on how to improve the students and in this pandemic situation, how to keep them involved or busy in these uh, uh, types of uh, talks. Okay. So adding to this, and uh, I thank uh, once again our uh, Kiran sir and participants and our coordinators and other faculties who have involved here now. And uh, we'll uh, look into this that uh, today's webinar will be again, it will be successful and uh, students will get uh, more knowledge here now. Thank you one and all and uh, over to you, Renuka Madam. Thank you, sir, sir, for the valuable and inspiring words. I would like to call upon Assistant Professor Kiran Kumar MS to introduce our chief guest. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Renuka, madam. A very, very warm good morning to uh, one and all present here. I am Kiran Kumar MS, Assistant Professor uh, working in Department of uh, Civil Engineering, uh, JIT Dawangere. It is a great honor for me to introduce and uh, welcome our today's chief guest, uh, Mr. Kiran Petadapur, sir. Kiran Betadapur sir is a practicing advocate and a patent attorney uh, from last 20 years. Uh, he invests in early stage of startups and is a qualified company secretary. He specializes in corporate matters, M&A, company valuation, patent litigation, land acquisition, contracts law, transfer of immovable property, intellectual property rights, and international trade law. Sir done bachelor's in industrial engineering from BMS College of Engineering, PG diploma in management studies in IISC Bengaluru, master's in industrial engineering and operation research in IIT Karakpur, and also secured bachelor of laws in Karnataka State Law University. In his career, sir added operations for the Birla's based out of California and served as a head of and financial segments for HCL HP in Mumbai. Sir also served as a president and a CEO of Kenware and also co-founder CEO of C Live Corporation. Sir enjoys teaching and delivers lecturers regularly in schools and colleges. He is equally uh, earnest about legal activism and constitutional reforms. His first book named Gita and the Art of Selling was nominated for the Grass book, Crasswords Book of the Year Award. I once again welcome you, sir, on the behalf of Jain Institute of Technology, 
Department of Civil Engineering and Institution Innovation Council. I welcome you, sir. Over to you, Renuka, madam. Thank you, sir, for the brief introduction about our presenter. Let's begin the session. Dear participants, if you have any queries or if you want to interact during the session, please type them in the chat box or kindly raise your hand. Over to you, Kiran Baddapur, sir. Thank you very much, madam. <clears throat> uh, if uh, uh, you could give me screen sharing rights, I would like to uh, share my screen and then we can get started. I presume this is now a way uh, visible. Uh, the screen is visible. I've shared it. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, yes, the next three slides. Uh, sure. It's, it's visible, right? Yes sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. The next three slides are extremely dear to me. I never fail to put them up. Uh, I always include them in my presentations because this gives us a snapshot of where we are today insofar as innovation is concerned. If you were to look at our country and ask the question, what are the major innovations out of India? Innovations that are world leading, that are market leaders, global market leaders. And if you think about this, you will come up perhaps with yoga. You will say Ayurveda is a contribution that India has made to the world. You will talk about cosmetic surgery because Sushruta is supposed to have started cosmetic surgery. You will also talk about zero. You will say that zero was invented. Buttons, you know, your shirt buttons uh, were also invented in India. The ruler that we use, scale, that was invented in India. Chess, shampoo. Of course, uh, you may have uh, heard this song called Champi Tel Malis from a very old Hindi movie. Champi was the word from which shampoo was coined. Of course, Champi was an oil massage. Instead of oil, the West took the concept, replaced it with basically a soap, a shampoo. And it was a head massage with a, uh, and they called it uh, shampoo. Cotton gin, uh, this, this gadget that separates cotton fiber from cotton seed, that was invented. Again, that is about 300 year old invention. Natural fibers, silk, cotton, that was invented in India. And this is something that I'm sure everybody would know. Muslin, you know, this thin cloth textile was invented in India. Across the board, if you were to look at all these inventions, they're all 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old, 300 years, 500 years old. In the recent past, our track record insofar as innovation is concerned or innovative products, ideas are concerned, really speaking, we have to admit it has been poor. We have been innovating, uh, innovating no doubt. But then that whole uh, uh, innovations that are global market leaders, that is where we are behind. And, and this reflects very well in the graph that I have put up here. India's GDP, gross domestic product, uh, GDP, as you all know, is a measure of economic activity. So if I were to step out of my office, buy a cup of coffee for 20 rupees, there is 20 rupees worth of economic activity that has taken place in India. So in 0 AD, India accounted for about 35% of all global economic activity. If you were to take the entire economic transactions, the sum, sigma of all economic transactions the world over, India accounted for one third of it. So India, truly speaking, was the economic capital, the economic hub of the entire world. And then as you see, uh, you know, after the Mughals came in also, we were somewhere around 25, 26, 27 uh, percent of global uh, GDP. And then after the British came, 
the downward slide started. And when the British left India, our uh, contribution to global economic activity had really come down to some two, three, four percent. Today it is about six, seven, eight percent. So we have recovered over 70 years from three, four percent to about uh, seven, eight percent. So why did this happen? The answer for this is here. I, of course, stands for innovation. So we stopped being innovative as a people. Besides innovation, they did destroy, the British destroyed our industry. Besides destroying our industry, they also destroy, destroyed this self-esteem. You know, this feeling that I'm good, I'm capable, I'm competent, confidence. They took away our confidence. This thing that I can also do it, no matter what it is. I can innovate, that whole feeling. And that thing of self-pride, you know, pride in what we do, pride in what we achieve, what we accomplish, that whole feeling of whatever somebody else does, I can improve upon it, I can enhance it. So it is only in the recent past that this emphasis on being proud about who we are, our culture, our heritage, our capabilities, our ancestors, their engineering excellence, all this has started. And we've again begun to innovate. Uh, and so when, you, when somebody looks at this whole thing of innovation, the two key things that come to one's mind is intellectual property, which is what the IP here stands for, and VC. Uh, most of you would perhaps think that VC stands for venture capital. Sure enough, it does stand for venture capital. Venture capital plays a significant role when it comes to startups and entrepreneurship. But the VC here that I have put in is value creation. Innovation cannot happen without value creation. Now, what exactly is value? There is something, any, any product that you see, any material that you see, there is the concept of intrinsic value. Let me explain it with an example. This is a steel ingot. Now, these ingots can weigh up to 10 tons. But here is an ingot. Uh, let's say this is 20 kilos or 30 kilos or whatever it is, 50 kilos. The average price of steel in this ingot is about 400 rupees. Uh, this is a market price. I've picked up the prices from the internet. Suppose I were to use this uh, steel ingot and then make horseshoes out of it. I have value added. I have used a certain raw material as an input and I have carried out some manufacturing process. And by virtue of that manufacturing process, using some technology, I have manufactured these horseshoes. The horseshoe weighs about 200 to uh, 200, about rupees 200 for a 100 gram horseshoe. So effectively, whereas the steel ingot was 400 rupees a kilo of steel, because of this process of value addition and to make it uh, perhaps a little more malleable or a little more ductile, uh, I may have added some other uh, uh, metal to it and made an alloy out of it for manufacturing horseshoes. Now, suddenly, instead of 400 rupees a kilo, I can get 2,000 rupees a kilo, uh, effectively. Uh, of course, the cost also would go up a little bit because I've added some other metals and this is basically an alloy. That is perhaps, uh, that, can, that is abrasion uh, resistant. You know, it can resist abrasive forces. Instead of making horseshoes, suppose I were to take the same steel as an input and make sewing needles out of it. It's a little more complicated. The manufacturing is a little more sophisticated because the needles are very small, very thin. So technology has to catch up and be uh, uh, technology should enable manufacturing the sewing needle. Uh, the average needle uh, weighs about two grams costs about 10 rupees. So suddenly the same kilo of steel now fetches me 5,000 rupees as revenue. The other extreme, again, I take the same steel, manufacture balance springs out of it. Balance, balance springs are used in wristwatches. The average balance spring 
weighs about 1 milligram, costs about rupees 5. So effectively, a kilo of steel fetches 50 lakh rupees. Obviously, uh, uh, there is a lot of technology behind a balanced spring. Uh, because even getting that uh, spring, man, being able to manufacture that spring, you know, very thin, very fine spring is a big, big challenge. So, but as you can see, as you move from this raw material, obviously, if you were to look at uh, iron ore, iron ore probably for a ton would be some 200 rupees or 400, 500 rupees. So you will see that as I go along value adding, on one hand, the effort, the labor, all that goes up, obviously. Besides the value, while I'm value adding, technology also, the technology that I need also goes up. And behind the technology, the intellectual property that supports the technology also goes up. So basically, innovation and technology move simultaneously. And this is something that government of India has also realized. And there is tremendous. Just two days back, they announced uh, a package of 9,000 uh, crores for the steel industry, steel sector. We manufacture about 100 million tons a year of steel, 100 million plus tons, out of which only about 18% of our output is special alloys, special steel output. And a government of India wants this percent to go up because special steels and special alloys, we are still dependent on the West. Now, this whole process of uh, innovation, you know, and the, and the economics behind it, the support that uh, the, the, the process of innovation and intellectual property gives for technology is something that this man called Joseph Schumpeter, he was a brilliant man, uh, an Austrian finance minister uh, in, the, in the 50s. He came up with this theory called the theory of creative destruction. He said the only way you can sustain innovation in a country is by constantly innovating, constantly coming up with new products, which, which destroy the previous products. So basically, the new product that you come out with makes the old product obsolete. The, the, the theory of uh, creative destruction, and that's the only way you can sustain uh, economic activity in a country. Effectively, the economic activity itself uh, consists of ideation. It starts with ideation, the way the economy works. Kiran, sir? Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Sure. Sir, on the top right screen, right. there are three dots. Uh, please switch no. off that annotation, sir. No, I think I have switched it off. Uh, somebody else must have switched it on. Somebody else with control over the screen. No, sir. Uh, you can disable that annotation, sir. The person who is sharing the screen. Okay. Okay. For others. Yeah, I've disabled it. L hopefully now from the next slide onwards, it will not show up. Yeah, sir. So, uh, you, sir. Please so the, me. yeah. So the innovation process starts with ideation. That's the first step. Anytime an idea occurs to, uh, let's say, an engineer or a scientist, that aha moment, that Archimedean Eureka moment, that's the starting point for innovation. You know, but then ideation is this, just the beginning. For it to be innovative, there are three things that are necessary. One is the idea should be useful for somebody, number one. Number two, it should be capable of being manufactured. You can always think of an innovation that you just cannot manufacture. You know, a thin, one uh, atom thick uh, filament. You know, it's very easy to think of such an idea, but very difficult to manufacture or uh, bring that idea to reality. So the second factor for innovation is it should be manufacturable, which means it is technically feasible. The third part of it is, Besides being technically feasible, useful one, feasible two, it should be viable in the marketplace. An idea that is possible that you can manufacture, which is technically feasible, but for which there is no market, 
which means nobody is willing to pay money to buy the product no matter how good the idea is the idea will fail which means the idea is not innovative so the focus of innovation should always be with large number of ideas and that whole filtering process for ideas and picking those ideas that are innovative which means they are likely they will be those ideas are definitely useful those ideas are definitely feasible technically and three those ideas are definitely economically viable the third step is investment so once an idea is innovative you need to invest on in it manufacture it and then you have economies of scale economies of scope all that coming into play and once uh, uh, once the economies of scale uh, once you've invested you industrialize and that industrialization again creates wealth so value and wealth creation are parallel processes that go together and the, and when wealth gets created that wealth again creates jobs it creates uh, somebody is requesting remote control of my screen do i approve it sir uh, somebody is ex uh, requesting remote control of my screen uh, do i approve it darshan the mr darshan lk no sir no sir okay okay so finally when once uh, after all this uh, pr process this ideation to innovation to investment and then industrialization happens value and wealth get created money profits and that profits when investors create profit they again invest in startups that's how the venture capital industry works what exactly is property rights what is intellectual property and the best way to e explain this is with example any property right there are four things that we lawyers talk about when we talk property rights the first one is when i am using uh, actually dr patil is calling just one second hello sir yeah one second sir sorry for the inconveniences sir please continue uh, yeah not a problem so so okay so the, the best way of understanding this is with this example when when i'm using a pen you know we lawyers we have this uh, we never say i'm using a pen we always use this these high sounding english words we say we are enjoying the pen and so it's not not writing or using the pen but enjoying the pen so one of the rights is about enjoying that's a right that goes with property possession if i am holding a pen or keeping it in my pocket i'm supposed to be possessing the pen and obviously if i purchased it i go to a shop i have paid money for it i have purchased the pen it is ownership i have owned the pen why because i paid money to buy the pen but suppose the owner himself had displayed had put up in his shop stolen pen then although i have paid money the pen really belongs to somebody else because the pen itself was stolen right so title so although i have paid money lawyers say that the purchaser of the pen has no title over the pen so there are four of these things that we talk about as property rights when i say property i'm talking about the right my right to enjoy the pen to possess the pen to own the pen 
and to have title over the pen and this applies to all uh, property be it uh, uh, movable like a pen or removable like uh, like land buildings office etc uh, and these are all uh, words that we use continuous in, uh, enjoyment of pen peaceful possession these are all legal terms i'll just skip it so effectively property rights when i say property it is about uh, possessing enjoying owning and having title over the property and rights relate to using possessing which i already talked about retaining fruits suppose i rented the pen out to somebody and somebody was willing to pay me money for the pen being rented that is a fruit of the property i could gift the property to somebody assign rights over the property improve the property lend rent lease license and sell it and finally if i chose to i i can even destroy i can even trash drop it into my trash can uh, so when we talk of property rights it's all these this bundle of rights uh, over that property that we refer to and classification wise it is tangible property that we can touch feel see intangible all of intellectual property rights fall under intangible property why is it so vital brand value let me take the example of brand value brand value again is an intangible uh, asset for companies the top 100 most valuable us brands in 2018 the brand value just the name google just the name apple amazon the top 100 companies were valued the brand value of these companies was 3.16 trillion dollars so 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 as you can see and and again the advantage with ip you know over a period of time the the component of intellectual property that is intangible assets has risen uh 1975 Eighty percent of the top five hundred companies' assets were tangible: buildings, machinery, plant, factories, etc. In two thousand ten, eighty percent was intangible, which means patents, trademarks, copyrights, all those intellectual property, brand value, etc. And two thousand twenty, my gut feel is close to ninety percent of all. Uh, capital uh, uh, value market value of large companies would be intellectual property the different types i'm sure you would be familiar trademarks registered uh, designs uh, that is product design it can be product design it can be ic even ics can be uh, trade uh, can be protected uh, patent protected intellectual property copyrights patents confidentiality trade secrets all of these are there but the focus because the uh, it's a uh, the audience is mostly uh, engineers and uh, faculty of uh, an engineering institute i'm going to talk about patents patents basically is about protecting technology rights over uh, a, a, an invention everything is referred to as an invention for patentability for for if you have an idea and if you want to figure out whether the idea is patentable which means whether you can get a patent for the idea there are four key criteria that you must remember and the first one i'll explain and all four criteria for patentability that is these are if these four criteria are not there the office that is the patent office will not grant a patent the first one if you look at the shoe here these are ladies shoes each pair uh, the one at the top the red soled uh, shoe here was first this design industrial design or product design was conceived by by a company called christian lubotin a french company and this was so each pair incidentally of these shoes cost 2000 dollars that is about 1 and 1/2 lakh rupees they came up with this and they and they filed for a design patent red sole because till then all shoes were either black sole or they were tan color soles and because this was very popular they had already patented it and now one other company that is eve son lorraine again a french company came out with a all red shoe immediately christian louboutin 
took the filed a lawsuit in the court against Yves Saint Laurent, saying you have infringed our design patent. The patent office upheld the patent, said it was unique. The idea was unique. There was newness. Till then, all shoes were either black, uh, the soles, or they were brown, tan color. So the very fact that a red color was used for the first time was so unique, so new, so original as a thought that the patent was valid. So the first criterion is it should be the idea behind the invention should be unique. It should be novel, which means new, and it should be original, which means nobody should have thought about it. The second criterion is again an, another example. This was a simple invention of, you know, when you have a list of clients with name, age, uh, income level, uh, uh, etc., sex, uh, you know, the gender, male, female, etc., and you want to target them for advertising, you know, uh, let's say an email campaign. For that email campaign, you would want to address your emails to profiles that the profiles of those people in the database who matched the target audience profile which means i am if i am a marketer and i want to reach out to all uh, engineering students in the you know below 20 years uh, and studying in city colleges urban areas then i want to only send the email to such people so all that they did was they had these attributes in the database, a very simple, uh, pretty much a flat file kind of a thing. And the once the criteria was identified, uh, the email automatically, the software would add automatically uh, look for uh, all those uh, records, the, the attributes of the, uh, uh, the database, the people who were in the database. Uh, uh, matching the attributes that were defined uh, and then it would uh, 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 the logic that was there for the software would then send the email to the person uh, provided the logic uh, the the attributes of the person match the logic or the criteria that was uh, defined for sending of the uh, of the uh, emailer itself in the campaign now perfect web was the one that had patented it info usa copied it so the next thing you know, it reached a court of law. The court, after all the proceedings were over, they said the patent had nothing that was an inventive step. It was too obvious. They said, they, although a patent had been granted, they said in the first place, the court held that in the first place, the patent should not have been granted because there was no inventive step. It was obvious anybody, any marketer wanting to target his email campaign or, you know, online campaign, banner advertising or pop up advertising or whatever. It would logically want to serve his or her own market. And it is very, very commonsensical for such a person to look at the attributes of the prospect and only send the mail to those prospects who qualified the criteria on the cr criteria that was set for the campaign. So basically inventive step is about a flash of genius. You know, somebody who has to come out with something that is so inventive, so new, so not obvious that uh, it changes status quo. It changes the way business is done, products are used, etc. And there can't be common sense, you know, rectangle with rounded edges. It, in a product, smooth, soft, rounded edges, that is too obvious, right? The third criterion is, and this is an example of a Nike shoe with a, with a embedded uh, chip for measuring speed. Uh, it was actually an iPod, Apple and Nike combined came out with the shoe that would give speed, distance covered, acceleration, uh, energy, calories consumed, uh, uh, maximum acceleration, uh, average velocity or average speed, etc. Elevation, slope, everything which would track everything and give it on an uh, 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 with the chip that was there. You could display it as an app 
on your smartphone, iPhone or your iPad. So this was a smart shoe patent. So if you look at this, shoes have always been there. iPod was already there. Uh, iPad was there. Tablet, uh, computers, everything was there. But the, the newness in this invention was the, was the fact that a chip was inserted in the shoe and used to measure uh, as a transducer. Uh, uh, right, uh, uh, various parameters were used, uh, were measured, and it was it was uh, the parameters were synthesized. It was analyzed, and then some output was given that the that the person suppose somebody is on a crash diet wants to keep track of calories being burned. So such people, it was very useful. So the third criterion that the office will look for is usefulness of the idea. So it is not enough for, your, for you to have an idea. You have to make sure that the idea is useful for somebody and that usefulness has to improve something that has existed till date. The Nike shoe improved the shoe that has existed for 2000 years, whatever X number of years. The fourth criterion is, let's say this is a perpetual motion device. You know, if you were to apply, if you were to come up with some uh, circuit diagram and say, you know, this will make my device perpetual motion. It will reject it because the the fourth criterion is that the idea should not be abstract, which means if you manufacture, if you prototype the idea, the prototype should work. A perpetual motion device, there could be uh, wind resistance, there could be electric, if it is an electric device, there could be resistance, energy losses, heat losses, all these as engineers, I'm sure you would be familiar with it. So the fourth criteria is this. On top of the acceptance criteria, there are a whole, whole lot of rejection criteria. So if your idea relates to any of these rejection criteria, the office will throw it out. First rejection criteria, again, the example here is of a, a device, a contraption, a mechanical device for changing bulbs. You have to take the device, put a bulb, a new bulb, take it up, hold it against the bulb that is burnt, you know, and then the device will, it's almost like a robotic arm. It will go up remove the bulb that is burnt and then insert this bulb, the new bulb, and then it will come out. Now, if you look at this, the idea was if somebody is needed to hold it up, might as well do it manually. Now, if it is household bulbs, this device looks silly. But if it is a street bulb, Maybe somebody can automate this process of a lever taking the contraction, co contraption up on its own for replacing street bulbs. So which means it will replace human labor. So if the, uh, the idea is silly, manually somebody holding the device is silly. But if it is about replacing street bulbs automatically, it's a great idea. So it all depends on how the idea itself gets presented. So the rejection criteria that you need to remember is that if the office thinks the idea is silly, they will reject it. Silly and frivolous. The second image picture here is about a contraption, you know, a piston, pneumatic or hydraulic or whatever it is. This invention, somebody conceived this idea for exercising the cheek muscles, the jaw muscles. And the, and the office thought it was silly, so they rejected it. So the, four, the, the second criteria is, again, this was a Canadian example of a company, alcoholic beverages company, that came up with these new design for their bottles, skull-shaped. It was an instant hit, not with uh, adults, children, school children, college children, loved the design of the skull. And they started buying these bottles. So the Canadian government banned the bottle, the skull-shaped bottle. Why? Because underage people, uh, it, it attracted underage people into buying it and presumably also drinking the alcoholic beverage. So the second rejection criteria is it should not be against public policy.
So in this case, it was not in the interests of public. Hence, the Canadian government banned the idea, although it rejected it. it uh, although the design patent had been granted, awarded, they cancelled the patent on it. And it should not be against morality. The third criterion, again, this is a contraption. It looks like a centrifugal, uh, a centrifuge, a centrifugal uh, a contraption wherein somebody, you know, for astronauts kind of a thing, uh, for them to experience higher G forces, you know, something that would keep rotating them. This contraption was actually invented or at least thought of by somebody who wanted to use it for assisting pregnant women with delivery, delivering child. The government rejected it because they felt there was no knowing how higher 4G, 3G would, uh, what kind of effect that gravitational, that acceleration would have on children, on the baby. And uh, they felt and, and hence, they rejected the patent application. So the third rejection criteria is it should not be against public health. So no knowing what effect this will have on the baby in the mother's womb. There is no knowing what effect it will have on the mother. So any time the office thinks it could pose a risk to the health of people, the idea, they will reject it. There are other several other rejection criteria that the Indian Patent Office uh, uses for rejecting applications, discoveries, they will reject. Suppose uh, nine planets, you know, they say eight, nine, Pluto, ninth, and then they said Pluto is not a planet. Then again, they said, no, 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 Pluto is a planet. Suppose somebody were to discover, I were to discover a 10th planet and call it Kiran and apply for a patent application, it will get rejected because the, the, the object, the 10th planet, already existed. I have only seen it, observed it for the first time. Uh, example, gravity. If somebody were to file a patent application for gravity, it will get rejected. Atomic energy related in India, it get, always gets rejected. It, you know, the, the law itself says that no patent will be awarded to any idea related to atomic energy. Agricultural methods, because that is again nature working. Suppose if I were to say I've come out, I've grafted two rose plants and now I have red rose or uh, sorry, or black rose using red and something, some other color, they will reject it because it is nature that has worked. Mathematical algorithms will get rejected unless and until you have a end use for it. Now, Google with its page rank algorithm came up with a better system for indexing and displaying, searching and displaying uh, uh, web results. So if the algorithm is for a particular application and you can identify it and that algorithm improves the quality or enhances that product, then uh, patent will be granted. Uh, another example is the simplex algorithm, which was used basically uh, in switching, which is used in switching networks, uh, you know, Karmakar algorithm. Uh, that is also used. Uh, simplex is, of course, operations uh, uh, research related. But uh, in queuing theory algorithms, they've been used in switching networks. Karmakar algorithm is an example, which AT&T used incidentally. In a nutshell, Whenever you think of an idea and you want to ask yourself, is the, is the idea patentable? You have to remember these acceptance criteria and the rejection criteria. Why would anybody want to patent? It's an expensive exercise. Why would anybody want to patent? The reason is, if you patent your idea, you get a 20-year period during which nobody else can use the idea product manufacture a product based on that idea and that's the reason why you would want to patent it because it gives you a major advantage a competitive advantage in the marketplace the rest of it is uh, you know the criteria is something that you will remember outside of it you have to remember that every patent application that you file pertains only to that particular territory so in India, if you file an application with the Indian Patent Office, which is the Controller General of uh, Controller General's Office for Patents and Trademarks, 
that uh, and if the controller were to grant a patent it will only be applicable in india unless and until there are other things that you do such as applying you know you file your application under pct a patent cooperation treaty for which india is also a signatory or but that you know by just because india is a signatory of pct does not mean if indian patent office were to grant a, a patent that patent would be applicable the world over it only means if the application is made under pct the date on which you file your application will be considered as the date of invention and that date of invention from that date two and a half years actually 31 months within 31 months you can file in other countries that are also under pct without filing a patent application in the other countries let's say us europe uh, uh, israel japan china korea your patent even if it is granted in india will not apply in those other countries which means manufacturers in those countries can very easily copy your idea and get it patented there by improving it marginally many times what happens the uh, the office even if there is no patent that have, that they have issued in india will send objections when they evaluate the idea the application they will identify objections they will look at other patents that have been granted in other countries and then say this idea already exists so how is it new how is it original so they will ask you these questions and you will have to uh, respond to the patent controller and explain uh, to the patent controller how your idea is unique so it's a very very elaborate process that exists and that process itself i have explained Uh, patentability criteria and non patentability criteria the one other thing at this juncture that uh, everybody every engineering student every engineer every scientist every innovator every entrepreneur should remember is that as part of the patenting process there is something known as claims uh, you have to specify what you are claiming as your intellectual property that is legally drafted and that is where patent agents and patent lawyers like uh, myself we come into picture what we say is that should be because uh, you know office when you file when you when you come up with an idea initially you will do a quick check on google you will do some search you will find out you will try to find out if somebody all else already has protected the idea and uh, and then you will file because you want to be the first person to file now later on you will do a thorough search and then identify whether the idea is truly patentable and this whole process takes about and so basically in that uh, during that uh, we refer to it as state of art or prior art search you there is a you have the option of either filing with specification that is with the claims up front or without the claims if you file without the claims it is called a provisional application with a provisional application you still get a 12 month period during which you can fine tune your idea you can improve your idea you can research you can search you can see if there are any research papers that have been published related to your idea you can also research patent databases us patent databases european patent office databases see if somebody there has invented it already so this so the two types of applications are basically provisional application versus complete application a complete application is one in which the claims are also uh, drafted and the included and the and the claims are included in the application that you make so this is something that you need to remember how do you start innovating the best way i can tell you to start innovating is to think of uh, uh, patenting or all patent rights as three silos huge silos remember i said patents are valid for 20 years so the first one anything more than 20 years it's an expired patent so even if somebody let's say somebody in us has patented it and it is uh, more than 20 years you can just look at what they invented copy the design manufacture it 
because those expired patents there are no rights that the inventor holds on those patents so this is in the past these are past inventions which are no longer uh, on which there are no longer any patent rights expired rights are there the rights are expired the other is this 20 period is not over so the rights are still there so if you if you copy that patent you know the idea in the patent you will be violating you will be infringing that patent so these are still valid so they are in the present and those that are in the process somebody has come up with an idea but he is drafting the patent he is writing the patent applying to the office or somebody has already applied to the office the office is reviewing the patent application so these are future grants that the office will make this whole patenting process itself takes anywhere between 2 and 1/2 to 6 years uh, in fact i should be saying 2 years to 6 or maybe even more years uh, there is an accelerated process in india even the accelerated process generally takes about 3 uh, years but elsewhere it uh, can be as less in the us for instance it can be as quick as 15 months etc so what i would always recommend engineers scientists we have the largest population of engineers scientists etc our engineers and scientists should really look at expired patents or even existing patents and see how they can enhance it the best thing for our manufacturers our startups smes to do is to look at expired patents see if they can manufacture any of those products that are there which are not available in india and scientists and innovators can look at patents that are currently there and review them understand them do that prior art research and see how the the the, the product can be enhanced because generally people uh, gravitate towards cutting edge the point that i'm trying to make is it is not necessary to always be cutting edge when it comes to patent protection idea protection right and the example that i have here is this contraption you know uh, whenever uh, I, in a, in every interactive session i ask my audience to guess this uh, device this gadget and generally they give uh, several answers they sk- they say it is some kind of a periscope some say it is kind of a microscope you know optical device all sorts of guesses they make but really speaking this is nothing but a mixer grinder what does this do this actually is a fitting that gets mounted under your sink now in the us every house pretty much has this sink this gadget under the sink it's it's called a garbage disposer wet garbage that we produce fruit peel vegetable peel etc in the us they don't dispose it off in the uh, as garbage they just put it into the kitchen sink and then what do they do when the kitchen sink gets clogged and water starts accumulating in the sink they will switch it on and this uh, device starts rotating this mixer so it grinds the peels that you have put in the wet waste that you have put into it and the water will clear here what do we do first thing our when our kitchen sink gets clogged we take a metal hanger make it long and then try to poke it in you know and try to clear it it does not get cleared we uh, run to the sh- shop by uh, draino you know and put it in even if that does not remove the clog we put acid and then we call the plumber to repair the uh, kitchen sink if you look at it this device if you were to look at the bill of materials may cost 1000 rupees or 1200 or 500 rupees this is being imported in india this was invented way back in some 50s or 60s in the us and the patent had expired now somebody thought uh, and and believe me there are such 10 million such patents that are there somebody came up with this idea why not enhance this same garbage disposer and make and have a electronic in it a control system in it which can increase the speed of the rotor which can take heavy duty uh, garbage and dispose it and they did come out with it in 2007 they came up with this invention they filed it and in 2009 the patent was granted so if you see an existing product 
was enhanced in case of the garburetor or the garbage disposer unit so there are 10 worldwide there are 10 plus million close to 10 15 million patents that have expired this can be a source of inspiration for all scientists all engineers all technocrats all uh, entrepreneurs innovators etc researchers etc and we have to use this so on that note i will talk about uh, ip management so in i basically talked about ip rights and how one can create ip rights in our engineers and scientists but once you start ideating and creating ip rights how do you manage those rights there are both hard challenges when it comes to ip and there are certain soft challenges what are the hard challenges first and foremost your idea has to be patentable patentability is a big challenge and i i have given the criteria for patentability and the rejection criteria the acceptance criteria and the rejection criteria and then the validity of the patent 20 year period that itself you need to be very very familiar with aware of freedom to operate many times what happens there are uh, spaces technology spaces cutting edge spaces uh, emerging technologies where there are many people who are trying to get in many times what happens there is a race to be the first in the market and many times the product may have some electronics the product may have some mechanics me- mechanical components in it so what happens is uh, for the final product to be delivered to be uh, marketed in the market in the marketplace would need both these mechanical components and the electronic components to be ready so many times companies join hands get into partnership agreements and they say okay both of us are in related spaces so let's join hands let's collaborate cooperate and then you come up with uh, the mechanical you design the mechanical parts and you hold the mechanical intellectual property on the product and we will work on the electronics and keep the electronics ready that kind of agreement is called freedom to operate so although we are in similar spaces we will have some kind of understanding wherein we will divide the load and that load that we divide basically we will allow you to operate in you can create your own ip in those spaces landscape and competitive analysis is something that most of us in my experience most of my uh, innovators who have come to me for patenting they don't do what does landscape mean if you think you have an idea make sure you research that idea thoroughly make sure you understand what are the other competitive products that are there in that space how how do i compare with those products in what way i am am i better than those products and along with competitive analysis you need to keep claims drafting in mind a integral part of competitive uh, analysis and landscape analysis is what we refer to as white space analysis when you look at competing products where ip is protected you would want to identify small areas where nobody is occupying nobody has thought of it and nobody has claimed it uh, uh, that whole thing of intellectual property boils down to claims that you are saying this is a claim that you are putting in saying uh, this is my idea this hence this is my ip so this competitive analysis white sp- white space analysis landscape analysis is a integral part of claims drafting and also you are prior art search because this is your state of art this is where it exists what what the uh, technology is all about current technology office action is when the patent office sends you a response uh, they will analyze they will talk about patentability they may say there is no inventive step in your application you have to reply to it otherwise they will treat the application as uh, as being uh, uh, as having been abandoned they will just close the file and that will be the end of the application Infri- infringement search while you are working on your own patent application uh, you need to necessarily look at prior art which you will do as part of that prior art search 
and your landscape analysis you will look to see if there are any sub areas in your idea where you are infringing others patents because if you infringe their patent they might file a lawsuit against you and claim compensation claim damages and finally all of this patenting and patent filing uh, work has to align with your business while these are hard challenges which means business related challenges there are also certain soft challenges that are there that you need to necessarily remember while managing your ip portfolio intellectual property portfolio that is first and foremost market impact there is no point having a patent uh, on your resume let us say if you are an inventor uh, other than a, a number that shows up in your resume if you cannot make money off of the idea the idea is useless so first and foremost while you are thinking of ideas thinking of protecting uh, the idea the ip behind the idea intellectual property you need to necessarily think think about what is the impact that the idea is going to have in the market i uh, uh, right at the beginning i talked about uh, uh, value the value proposition that value proposition is extremely important if there is no value proposition of the idea you know that the idea has there is no point protecting ip of the idea but value proposition is the starting point you would want the value proposition to be compelling ideally a compelling value proposition will be successful in the marketplace beyond compelling if it is disruptive which means it changes the way the market works or the market the product exists that is a disruptive idea and a disruptive value proposition finally if it reshapes the market that is what one would ideally hope to achieve with ideas portfolio value you know value of your portfolio ip portfolio you need to necessarily keep that in mind any time you think somebody else has uh, violated your patent your uh, uh, intellectual property and you want to file a lawsuit make sure you can estimate the damages because when you go to a court you need to put a number on how much money you have lost because the other party has violated your patent there are also uh, an integral part of uh, the soft challenge of patenting is trend forecasting technology itself progresses in a certain manner if you look around if you look at all the products anything that is done repetitively by uh manually repeated repetitive uh processes that are done manually will get replaced by mechanical devices mechanical devices will get replaced by electromechanical devices electromechanical devices will lead to electronic devices the moment it becomes electronic you have integration you have uh, uh automation you have uh, intelligence artificial intelligence you have plug and play you have all these enhancement uh, visual uh, ui graphical user interface all this software related software firmware related and hardware related things will come into play that is something that you need to understand and all of ip is useless if you do not know how you are going to make money off of the idea so it is not enough for you to have an idea but constantly you should think of how am i going to create money how am i going to sell it and finally it is about sustainability there is a process ipr today if i have i have to evergreen it which means 20 years it is valid before that 20 year period is over i have to enhance that product idea uh, on my own so that the life cycle of my idea now instead of being just 20 years may become 25 years 30 years so innovation itself is a continuous process finally if if you think somebody has infringed your uh, intellectual property you would want to litigate these are all the soft challenges that are there when it comes to ip management uh, whatever i have discussed today is with specific regard to uh, patenting patentability 
but the same thing applies to copyrights the same thing applies to trademarks the same thing applies to ge geographic indications every other type of intellectual property that you can think of now uh, if there are any questions uh, please do let me know dear participants you can interact with us sir so if you have any queries so please type them in the chat box or please raise your hand good morning am i audible yeah yes you are good morning good morning sir so the the my question is pwd and highway department has acquisition many lands in a village road for extension of roads without giving any prior notice then what is the legal procedure the question is also in chat box. okay oh, oh, okay see any time uh, see there is a there is a process first and foremost you need to understand whether it is pwd that has issued the acquisition notice of course this is not related to ip nonetheless because i am an advocate i can handle this and i am familiar with this area i have matters in the high court related to this there is also national highways authority of india uh, which is what you mentioned highway department so there are two different laws there is a there there is a certain uh, defined process for determining the compensation that is awarded firstly there is a procedure that is well defined a, there is a preliminary notification for against which the and and under that notification you will have to give the village name you will have to give the taluk you will have to give the district the hobli etc and then the survey numbers that are going to be acquired and then those any any of those land owners who are not willing or who are against that acquisition they will be given an opportunity to uh, uh, file a objection with the special with the land acquisition officer with the special land acquisition officer if the land acquisition officer is convinced that it is a valid uh, uh, objection that has been raised Uh, they may change the route they may uh, exclude this they may denotify the survey number once this process is over there is another phase wherein a final notification is issued after all these objections are taken into consideration somebody may object uh, you know you have notified the survey number but there are 500 large teak trees that are there on on that uh, notified survey number so uh, you know you will have to cut those trees down and it is not uh, good for the environment etc if the if the acquisition authority agrees uh, then of course they will denotify after this they will notify with the price that is fixed now there are rules that clearly say within 5 kilometers of uh, the town what will be the price it will be four times the uh, the guidance value so the land acquisition officer himself or herself will say this is the price at which we will acquire it now that price may not be acceptable even then you can file an objection and say and say uh, and say uh, and challenge the acquisition itself in a court of law if finally everything gets overruled and if you feel the compensation is not adequate even for that compensation you can uh, file in a approach a court of law so basically you, whatever your grievance may be your grievance may be that uh, that uh, the land should not be acquired or the grievance could be that the compensation is not enough the grievance could be that the procedure the right procedure has not been followed regardless of the grievance for every grievance you can Uh, approach a court of law but there is a process before you approach a court of law you need to necessarily keep in mind the procedure without exhausting many times i see uh, lawyers filing acquisition you know against uh, acquisition land acquisition writ petitions in the high court that's not the right way of doing it there is a there is a mechanism that the uh, act provides through the special land acquisition officer of filing if you have a grievance of seeking that dispute and you have a dispute 
re resolution of the dispute through that acquisition officer you should do that only if that fails then can you go and any time you need information related to the acquisition you can you make use of the rti act and file an rti application with the uh, with the land acquisition officer who will furnish the information that you need for filing a judicial uh, proceeding uh, before the land acquisition officer uh, does that answer your question or do you have uh, uh, something more and and part of this notification procedure is they will send notices out to you through by registered post with acknowledgement due besides advertising in the newspapers uh, and they will also fix a copy a print out on if it is a house that is being acquired they will either serve a copy physically to the owner of the house or they will uh, post post the notice itself on the door if it is a if it is a agricultural land they will serve the notice on the owner of the land as per the rtc so uh, so as per their own land records whatever as per their land records whosoever is the owner they will serve whosoever is holding the khata they will serve it on him uh, khata and the pani uh, all of which you know i'm sure any other yes, questions sir. yes sir thank you kiran sir uh, there are some questions sir uh, coming from the youtube line uh so the question is can i get an intellectual property right just from the result of a research once again i repeat the question sir can i get an intellectual property right just from the result of research yes you can remember the three criteria the the idea the research whatever your idea is you sh it should be useful to somebody many times research is statistics driven you will say 80% of people who have diabetes are likely to get covid now you change your population 80 may become 60 or 80 may become 90 you know it it's it, it's not concrete it's not repeatable it's not you cannot reproduce that result i mean or you cannot guarantee reproduction of the result uh, if you were to repeat the whole experiment or the research so the first criterion is it should be useful and even if even if you somebody were to know even if you were to come out with that research and i were to know oh so if i have diabetes i have 80% probability of fallen sick uh, falling sick with uh, covid it means i do have some chance that is there is never a guarantee either whether i will fall sick or whether i will not fall sick so there is it's not concrete yeah, i mean there is nothing it's in no way is it useful it is just useful as information for me to remember about the probability of my going down with covid so first criterion is usability second is it should be that usable idea or product or service should be manufacturable or you should be deliverable in case of a service and the third thing is ideally Uh, so with these two answered you know provided that inventive step is there and it is not obvious all those criteria that i used earlier mentioned earlier you would want to make sure and protect those ideas that are economically viable there is no point uh, uh, i mean if you are a pure researcher and as part of your own profile you would want to show that not only do you hold have you published several research papers you have also you you also hold patents uh, and it is good to know as a academician that i i hold these patents and you know it's good because it may help you in your jobs your interviews um you know if you are an assistant professor you can uh, you will get elevated as a professor and things like that but a patent is basically for commercial exploitation you would want to commercially utilize it and that's the challenge unless and until you keep that in mind ideally you would not want to patent protect it patent protection makes sense when the idea holds commercial value uh, even otherwise many people do file patent applications there's nothing against not against uh, holding a patent and not commercially exploiting it but that's personal choice but i would if you are in research yes i mean i gave you the example of uh, the page rank algorithm uh, both uh, uh, page and brin larry page and sergey brin were phd students in stanford university and they came up with the page rank algorithm as part of their phd research thesis 
and look that page rank algorithm is what created a huge giant like google so research in the us you can clearly distinguish there is research research leads to applied research which means product driven market driven and then marketers come in manufacturers come in they take the idea they start manufacturing building products delivering uh, products and that is how that whole cycle ecosystem works and it is important that we in india also keep this kind of ecosystem in mind and work towards uh, building that ecosystem here now i see there is this other did i answer your question or is there any follow up questions yes, on that yes sir sir thank you sir sure uh, the next question and uh, professor uh, kiran kumar has asked this what is the difference between trademark and trade name the best way of understanding this is if you were to think of the apple the bitten apple the logo that's tip generally a mark you know it's visual name apple itself is a name now you may say but apple as a name existed for the fruit remember apple as a name people have associated with a fruit before but apple associated the name with a electronic manufacturer technology company with a computer manufacturer and consequently the name apple not only today applies to the fruit apple but it also applies to this company called apple and so when in trademarks when you talk of trademarks it includes all of this the name for instance xerox is a trademark but it is being used as a common noun so that that's a trademark name apple is a trademark you can trademark your name itself provided it is unique and nobody else and it ca causes no confusion in the marketplace the keys are like for instance today if i were to file for the name apple let us say for a for a uh, suppose i were to file it for a computer company it will get rejected because it will create confusion in the minds of people consumers customers in the market because just because i am naming my computer apple people may think it is us apple that is manufacturing it so th so that they will not permit to happen suppose i were to use the apple for let us say uh, uh, ceramic pots or cups and saucers the the office may grant me the trademark for it because apple computers nobody in the uh, market you know who goes to a shop will look at the apple cup and saucer and get confused and think oh let me buy this cup and saucer because it is apple computers that has manufactured it so so long as this distinction exists so the distinction can be product category product class you know basically they say class uh, it also exists it also uh, depends on geography so you have to look at this holistically to determine whether the name or the logo so the logo can also have a trademark logo if you were to look at ibm the color is the same it is it has lines the ibm is uh, drawn with lines uh, blue lines so nobody else can either make use of the name ibm or suppose i were to make use of the name kbm just for you know kiran business machines and use the same graphics of blue lines uh, so the office may object uh, ibm may file uh, a lawsuit against me why because my logo the way the graphics is designed looks like ibm and the market and a customer may get confused may not look at the logo properly because the logo is looking very similar to ibm's logo may get confused and buy my product thinking it is uh, ibm so what is what does trademark do trademark achieves two things if i am protecting my trademark it helps me create a certain impression in the market about who i am what i stand for uh, high quality high reliability good customer service so trademarks help me create brand value that's number 1 and number 2 it also helps me charge 
a premium in the marketplace over a period of time if i build my brand through trademarking that's one of the ways in which you can build your brand value uh, uh, over a period of time people will be willing to pay more money a premium price pay a higher price for products because they associate that product with quality with reliability with their own past experiences if the experience of a customer has been good with my product the customer is likely to uh, refer my product to others for purchase so this is the reason why trademarking is vital and everything logo can be trademark even jingles uh, the 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 if you turn a microsoft windows uh, system uh, it has that distinct jingle the windows jingle uh, you know when it powers on when it boots that jingle has been trademarked uh, the the harley davidson motorcycle the exhaust the exhaust kind of makes the sound potato 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 it, you know it has it has a distinct sound that sound has been trademarked nobody can have a silencer on their motorcycle which produces the same sound or similar sound so uh, there there is there is a lot to uh, trademarking uh, you know uh, i i wish i could have packed all of that in i just assumed since this is innovation and ip uh, innovation council that is running this i thought patenting is what uh, would be of great interest any other questions sir there is one question uh, also asked in the youtube sir right uh, can i sell my idea to a company without patent i once again repeat sir can i sell my idea to a company without any patent yes you can see uh, you know in hindi or urdu there is a saying mia bivi razi to kya kare kazi you have the idea now somebody is willing to pay money for the idea who is, nobody else can stop it now the problem for you is if you have an idea and you share the idea with the guy who is saying i will buy the idea and suppose he cheats you what are you going to do your idea is not protected you cannot go and file uh, a lawsuit against him or her so the risk is there so an idea ideally if you were to protect the idea and then we say assign the rights license the rights over that idea or the patent that you are going to be holding that's a better that's the lower risk option higher risk option is you have an idea and you go share that idea with a manufacturer and the next thing you know the manufacturer is already manufacturing he has not paid you a single penny what are you going to do then how are you going to prove that you had shared the idea firstly you have yourself not protected the intellectual property over the idea so until and unless you protected the intellectual property you cannot uh, you know market it and you should not market it because it becomes very easy for others to copy the idea that's your problem any other questions thank you sir sure samiksha you can unmute yourself and ask your question good morning everyone am i audible now uh, yes yes you are yes you are hi sir and i am samiksha so yes. my question is on gdp sir right In recent days, we have seen the statistics of our GDP, and can't we generate more GDP in agricultural sector? Why? Because majority people in our country depends upon agricultural field. Why government concentrate only on corporate or section to grow GDP? Very, very good question. Uh, actually, you are absolutely. Actually, you are absolutely right. uh you know there you know everybody talks about and i'm sure you would have also read it in the newspapers heard it in on tv programs or even maybe studied in your uh, college in you know even engineering students have engineering economics uh, as a subject at least we used to have it and i'm sure uh, the same thing applies to the students here everybody talks about gdp growth uh, you know 8% 10% 12% 12 all that the key thing is not just to achieve gdp growth the challenge is to make sure that your growth is balanced your growth uh, is sustained it's sustainable so the problem with 10% 12% sudden growth of your gdp is it becomes inflationary and such sudden growth spurt of economic activity generally leads to a larger gap between the rich and the poor which is not in the interest of any country in the long run 
So ideally speaking, if your population, as a thumb rule, if your population is uh, annually increasing at the rate of, let's say, 1%, the real GDP, if you can achieve 4%, 5%, 3% over hundreds of years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, that's a very, very healthy economy. What you would not want is one year growing at 12%, next year growing at, remember, once you've grown at 12%, the next year, your growth will be com uh, co compared with the previous year. Suppose I this year I've grown uh, negatively because of COVID, let us say. Next year, even if I increase the, it is very easy for me to grow positively. Uh, simply because last year, uh, 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 you know, prior to COVID, my economy was healthy. I, my economic activity was at a much higher level. So it is only because of COVID and lockdown and all that, which was necessary, my economic activity has dropped. Because many people have stopped traveling. Traveling would contribute to the economy, economic activity. So the next year, because my economy has contracted, it is much easier for me to get 10%, 12% growth, 8% growth. So what needs to be remembered in GDP growth, you're absolutely right. The balanced GDP growth is about the three sectors. What are the three sectors? The primary sector which is basically sector like mining, agriculture, etc. Secondary se sector is uh, industry uh, and uh, construction. The third sector is basically the services, the tertiary sector, primary, secondary, tertiary. The challenge in every one of these sectors is to go up the value chain. Now, constantly, every one of us should aim at Climbing, and the, and the reason is very simple. Suppose I would, and I gave you the example earlier of the steel ingot. That is what value addition does to you. That is what is meant by moving up the value chain. Suppose I were to just produce rice, right? Uh, it may fetch me 50 kilos, uh, kg, rupees a kilo. Now, suppose I were to think of how can I grow long grain rice, higher quality rice, better rice, and I use a little bit of technology and I enhance the quality of my uh, output of my field, then automatically perhaps I will be able to sell it for 70 rupees or 60 rupees. And this happens. And people take it to, there are different ways in which you can innovate, different ways in which you can generate a higher price. And moving up the value chain, especially in case of fruits, vegetables, etc., is to, you know, if, if, there is always the challenge of demand and supply. Suddenly during the season, you have tomatoes, uh, excess tomatoes having been grown. And the next thing you know, prices have dropped and uh, people in the mandis are willing to only pick it up for two rupees a kilo and then farmers protest and they throw it on the roadside. Now, supposing we were to build the agricultural infrastructure in such a way that, uh, uh, you know, you have refrigeration units where they can store their produce, perishable uh, agricultural products, uh, and then not only store, because even storing, there is a limited shelf life. Maybe you can store for a month, you can store for two months, three months. But suppose you were to come up with a, uh, fruit juice plant, you know, tomato juice plant, tomato ketchup plant, all that is moving up the value chain. So even farmers, our laws are fantastic. Farmers, 10 farmers can join hands, get their fields together and come up with a strategy. It's uh, farm and, uh, of course, cooperatives, you would, everybody would know. There is an equivalent called producer companies. Uh, under the Companies Act. You can set up an entity, you can manufacture, you can process, processed foods, all that. Basically, which would mean that suddenly you're no longer dependent on market forces. Suppose the value of price of tomatoes fall, you will not sell it in the market. So you will st store it in a refrigeration unit, storage unit, a uh, 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 freezer unit, and then take it out when the prices go up or the prices are now going at 20 rupees a kilo. Or better still, you will set up a small plant for making tomato juice or tomato ketchup or whatever. So this is what you need to necessarily focus on. W any other questions? 
And now, did I answer your question, or is there some other question? So basically, in our case, in terms of the GDP, we are driven by services. Our services contribution of services to the GDP is about fifty-five percent. Ideally, you would want thirty, uh, you know, thirty, thirty-five, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five. Agricultural sector contributes to about fifteen percent. It is, uh, and this is the reason for it because we are not value adding enough. Yes, yeah, sir. All the questions have been over now. Sure. Uh, thank you, sir, for your, uh, for reminding us about our own Indian invention and I'm sharing sure the valuable, valuable thoughts about property. Yes, thank you, sir, for reminding us about our own Indian inventions and sharing the valuable thoughts about property rights, patents. and how to put our ideas to market as a product with realistic issues with this motivational presentation it was a nice interaction with you sir now i would like to invite professor harish ks to present the vote of thanks over to you sir thank you ma'am good morning everyone to, to the one and all present here my name is harish assistant professor department of civil engineering it is such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank you all dignitaries on the behalf of iic council and the department of civil engineering jit davanagara i extend my gratitude to our honorable chief guest kiran betadapur sir to take out time from his busy schedule to grasp the event thank you for inspiring and encouraging us with your words on this special day sir thank you sir special thanks to dr ganesh db sir principal of jit davanagara for providing immense support to make the webinar successful thank you sir i extend my gratitude thank to you. dr rahul patil sir head of the department department of civil engineering to organize a webinar even in between the pandemic situation thank you sir i must thank the organizing team iic coordinators faculty members and non teaching staff for working hard to make this webinar successful i thank all the participants for their active participation thank you everyone once again for making it a great success thank you all <coughs> over to you ma'am kiran baddur sir uh, we are expecting few words about your uh, about this webinar in our opinion sir Uh, i i really thank you very much uh, firstly uh, for inviting me i really enjoyed the interactions i enjoyed uh, presenting it uh, to the audience i hope uh, uh, you know i've been able to convey the gist of uh, patenting it's a it's a very serious exercise any patenting intellectual property protection so the one piece of advice that i would give everyone is when you think you have a great idea don't start writing the patent application research it thoroughly understand what whether there are similar products how those products are different how will my product be better it is absolutely vital for you to think through the idea think research and then file uh, your patent application thank you very much for inviting me thank you sir okay uh, kiran sir i once again thank you it was really our honor for, to have you here now okay and our students and other participants uh, really got uh, valuable uh, knowledge uh, which you have shared okay i personally thank you for your uh, valuable time for sharing with us okay once again uh, thank you sir and in future we'll have uh, uh more webinars like this thank you sir A pleasure is all mine yes sir thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you i hope that today inspires ideas and discussions around the ways that we can make our thoughts and life better dear participants feedback link is shared in the chat box and also in whatsapp groups kindly give us your valuable feedback thank you for everyone It was a pleasure being with you today thank you one and all